Hey everybody, we're back at .NET Conf 2019. I have a new co-host, Myra, yes. how's it going? Good, excited. Yeah, I know, thank you so much for joining us. So as you probably noticed through the entire uh, conference, we've shifted um, co-hosts just because we're doing this 24 hours. Yes, it's amazing. It, and it gets pretty <laughs> tiring after a while. So thank you for all of our current, uh, for our uh, future and current co-hosts for uh, taking the time to do this. In particular, I would like to thank our Speaker, Santosh, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? We're doing great. Thank you. So you're here to talk about Cosmos DB for ASP.NET and SQL Server developers. Take it away, yep. sir. Let me share my screen. Oh. All right, you want to... There we go. Perfect. All right, are you guys able to see this? Yep, it all looks good. All right, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Go for it. Hello, and uh, welcome to .NET Conf. Uh, my name is Santosh, and I will be talking about uh, Cosmos DB today. Um, in particular, what I'll be focusing on is introducing Cosmos DB to the ASP.NET and SQL Server developer. A little bit about myself before we get started. I am a Microsoft MVP in Azure, and I'm also a Azure consultant at New Signature. So today, uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about Cosmos DB, uh, which is um, as we'll see, Microsoft's uh, database as a service for uh, a variety of models. And um, my whole approach to this is based around the fact that as a consultant, I go out into the field and talk to customers. And I often see that uh, people who have been working for a long time in the ASP.NET SQL Server world, um, especially in the relational database world, uh, they um, have a little bit of uh, difficulty uh, transitioning over to uh, a more schema agnostic world that Cosmos DB brings. So um, I will be talking about uh, some of the aspects uh, of Cosmos DB that I've learned along the way that I think are important. And um, also, I uh, was looking at the schedule, and there's, there is a, a, a data modeling talk, a couple of talks after mine. So I highly recommend that you are listen to that one also, because it's kind of complementary to this one. So with that, I'll get started. So what is Cosmos DB? Cosmos DB is uh, Microsoft Azure's uh, database as a service. Uh, this is proprietary to Azure, which means that if you go to AWS or any other provider, you would not find Cosmos DB on there. So uh, let's get that right off of the bat. Um, it's a horizontally scalable database. It is schema agnostic, uh, which means that it you can um, save data in a wide variety of uh, schemas, and it, it really it it will allow you to do that. Uh, it's a globally distributed database, which you can looking at this map, you can click on, uh, you know, a, a different uh, regions or for Microsoft all over the world, and it'll automatically spin up a Cosmos DB instance for you over there. So. It's a, a very easy to distribute globally. It's a multi-model database, which means uh, it has it uh, accommodates for different types of data. Uh, the SQL API and MongoDB, and I'll be talking about this shortly, are document-oriented. Cassandra is a column-oriented uh, database. And then you have Table API and Gremlin, which is a graph database. Um, you can elastically scale throughput and storage. So technically, there are hypothetically speaking, there is no limit to the amount of throughput and storage that you can provision for your Cosmos instance. And you can do this across the world in different Azure reg regions with the click of a button. And Cosmos DB is super fast. Like, you know, you probably heard about this by now. It's like single digit millisecond latency, and we'll talk about all of that. But the most important thing about Cosmos DB is that unlike SQL Server, it's not 
uh, you're not connecting uh, over TCP, uh, or you could do that, but it's a uh, cloud, a bunch of cloud-based REST APIs, and these are encrypted address. So you can connect to this as you would connect to any REST API. So, and a lot of the SDKs and everything else is built around that. So let's keep that in mind as we move along. Uh, let's talk about the multimodal aspects. The SQL API is a document-oriented database. Uh, it stores data in a JSON format, which, as you know, is the most widely used format, and it provides SQL-like query capabilities. And below is an example of the type of data it stores. Mongo is similar to SQL in that it's a document-oriented database. Uh, I would say that uh, the, the distinguishing factor is that Mongo is... Um, it supports the MongoDB via protocol, which means that if you write your code geared towards MongoDB, chances are chances are high that you can point it to the Mongo API at Cosmos and it would just work. So you can simply move from you know a hosted instance on-prem to uh, the to the Azure cloud by simply pointing your connection string to Cosmos. Our table API, uh, we have talked about Azure. Uh, we have heard about Azure Table Storage previously. Our Table API, uh, I call this as a premium version of Azure Table Storage. It provides exactly the same type of, uh, you can store exactly the same type of data with the same code, except that uh, you get much better throughput and you can leverage the global distribution of Cosmos DB. So uh, see, uh, you know, with uh, Azure Table Storage, we have you know, read access, uh, zone redundancy and all of that, we can easily scale uh, or we can easily use, enable global distribution by clicking on a map. And I'm kind of uh, moving fast because we're running, uh, you know, we, we're running behind, so bear with me. Uh, Gremlin API, uh, you know, data, as we know, uh, is in the real world is, uh, it can, uh, you know, often we find it hard to describe in relational databases. Um, with Gremlin API, uh, it's a graph database, um, and it's super relational. I call it super relational, which means that you can easily spin up uh, vertices, which are the round entities, and edges, which are the relationships that are shown by the lines. And you can spin this up real quick and attach them real quick, which means that there, uh, you can uh, do multiple levels of nesting of relationships, something Relational databases find it hard to handle. A Cassandra API is a column-oriented database. Uh, by grouping columns together, you can often load entire set of columns in memory for super fast calculations. Uh, a great use cases for these is time series data. Uh, talking of the different types, different models, uh, use cases for these are usually found in industries like retail, IoT, and gaming. Uh, this screen we are seeing right here is a great example of some uh, use of Cosmos um, because it uses the change feed, which we'll be talking about later in this talk. And you know, it leverages uh, microservices with the change feed to handle different functions in the retail industry. So. Uh, Cosmos DB can you can really uh, power up your applications by using Cosmos DB. Um, along the way, to, through my talk, I'll be talking about different developer types. Uh, and uh, uh, for this particular section, I'll say that leverage your your uh, uh, the appropriate data model based on the scenario. So if you want relational, uh, somewhat super relational data, you can use the Graph API. Um, or, you know, if you want uh, tabular data, you can use the table API. Um, and finally, you know, these models are meant to complement each other and not replace each other. So, uh, and um, talking, uh, speaking of that, I want to give you a thought experiment. So let's say if you are building your own LinkedIn, or I was building my own LinkedIn, this is how I would do the MVP. I would use the SQL API to uh, do the, profile pages and the posts and to do things, to do research on uh, people I may know, I may use the Gremlin API to list the graph. Uh, to log the visits, I may use the table API. To run summary calculations 
on years of experience, I may use Cassandra. And finally, for the sign-up and billing modules, because I want them to be transactional, I may actually use SQL Server. So there's no good or bad answer. What I'm saying is that you should uh, use Cosmos DB and um, complementary technology in appropriate scenarios. Hopefully, if you can take something out of the talk, let this be it. But you know, I have other great stuff in store for you. Um, and quick note, uh, this point forward, I will not be talking about the other models. I'll be sticking to the SQL Server, SQL API in Cosmos. Um, talk, speaking of uh, the global distribution, uh, Cosmos DB provides turnkey global distribution. Um, you can easily spin up uh, replica. You can uh, spin up replicas by clicking on the map, so you can spin up different instances. Um, one region, if you have your Cosmos DB hosted in only one region, you get four nines SLA, which is 99.99. .99. If you have greater than one region, you get five nines, which is obviously better. Um, and then you also want to talk about, you know, whether I want single region right or multi-region rights. And uh, these may vary based on your scenario. So if you have a read heavy application, it's easy to ingest your uh, data and then with a single region write. So for instance, your writer may be located on East US, so you ingest in East US and then you distribute all over the world so that when someone in Australia tries to read the data, it uses this feature called multi-homing APIs for Cosmos DB and it connects to the nearest instance, which is in Australia, to read the data. So that makes it uh, super fast. Um, Multi-region writes, I would use this in a scenario like, uh, if you have clients all over the world trying to write data, instead of sending someone from Australia to East US, I would enable multi-region write, which means that they write to the Australian instance and it would sync up over time. Um, Cosmos DB provides low latency for reads and writes. And you can see that you know, they're in single digit milliseconds. Uh, Cosmos DB provides five well-defined consistency models. Uh, most uh, databases that are competitors often provide like two, uh, which is strong and eventual, um, but Cosmos DB provides five. Uh, I will say that uh, strong is very similar to uh, the ACID compliant relational databases, but it only works in one region. So if you expand beyond one region, you'd have to use one of the other four. Uh, bonded staleness, it, you know, your reads and writes are never out of uh, order, uh, but the data lags by a certain interval or prefix. Now, within this interval, it's strongly consistent. Um, session, uh, uh, session consistency provides strong consistency within a particular session that's connected to Cosmos DB. Um, consistent prefix makes sure that your reads are always in order with the writes, but there's no uh, strong consistency anywhere. Um, and eventual, it means that your writes could be out of order with your reads. Uh, throughput, this is one of the most important. Now we're getting to some of the important parts which impact performance. Throughput um, actually uh, is measured in request units. And it's a combination of memory plus CPU plus IOPS. And one request unit is the equivalent of reading a one kilobyte document. Uh, I will say that um, uh, writes obviously consume more than uh, more throughput uh, because of indexing uh, and also uh, depending on the consistency. If you have strongly consistent versus uh, somewhat eventual consistent, it may con consume different amount of RUs, the same write operation. Um, Partitioning, um, there are two types of partitioning, logical and physical. Logical is controlled by the user by providing a partitioning key. Physical partitioning is uh, because it's horizontally partitioned and stored on disks. This is completely handled by the Cosmos DB engine and transparent to the users. Uh, the choice of partitioning key can make or break your database performance, which is why I will reiterate that you should attend the data modeling session after mine. Um, this is what a Cosmos DB instance looks like. Um, 
You start with uh, accounts, you just create an account. Our account can have zero or more databases. And these databases have containers of data, not to be confused with Docker containers. And these containers can have different elements like stored procedures, triggers, user-defined functions, and items. Items are the actual data. Now, depending on the model of Cosmos, like for instance, if you are in uh, SQL API, you would call your container a collection and you would call your item a document. So that's that's what this diagram represents. Um, obviously, with your once you create an account, you get an endpoint and connection keys. Uh, one quick, uh, another additional note on this, there's read-write keys and read-only keys. So use these judiciously when you're designing your document. Like if you're doing a CQRS system, you could use the read-write keys on the right side and read-only keys on the read side. Uh, the database, the database is the unit under which container of, containers of data are stored, but you can provision uh, throughput at the database level. Now, if you have multiple containers under the database, uh, the throughput you provision here is the cap. Collections over the uh, collections in SQL are the containers that store the data. Uh, you do not incur any charges until you create a collection. So you can create as many databases as you want with no charge. Um, and at the collection level, you can also provision, you can cap an individual collection for a certain throughput. Otherwise, it would vary based on what's, um, the usage may vary based on what's provisioned at the database level and how many other collections are there. Uh, documents, now these are the actual, this is the actual record, example of a record that may be stored in um, a SQL API uh, uh, collection. So for instance, if you take a um, JSON document that looks like the one on the left and store it, you'll end up with one that looks like the one on the right. And this is, uh, uh, even though we say that our, our data is uh, schema agnostic, uh, Cosmos DB adds some fields, as you can see at the bottom. The ID represents a unique name within a logical partition. It can be system generated or user defined. Uh, if the user doesn't uh, provide an ID, it'll automatically generate one. Um, e tag is used for optimistic concurrency control, which means that if there are multiple uh, uh, clients writing to the database, uh, the same record, then it may use the e tag to resolve the concurrency issues. Um, TS is the timestamp, and self is the actual URI for the item on the internet. So how do I develop Cosmos in Cosmos locally? Um, so, and this is where you can, uh, you, you can go to, you can Google uh, Cosmos DB, uh, Cosmos DB emulator, and it's a simple Windows installer and it uh, runs as a service on your computer. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Mm. So this loads uh, Explorer. Uh, this loads a emulator on your computer and you get the uh, connection uh, URI and the primary key for the uh, emulator. Now, um, the one thing to keep in mind is the local emulator stores multi models. So, for instance, you also see the MongoDB connection string, uh, and you see a data explorer that will show you the data. But uh, unfortunately, this data explorer, as I remember, if I remember correctly, is not available for Cassandra, Graph, and Table. And that may change. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, before we dive into code, is the uh, Azure Cosmos DB uh, .NET SDK. Since we're, we're talking about uh, you know, .NET Core 3, uh, this goes very well with that. This is the latest uh, instance uh, of the SDK, um, and it has some improvements on it, and I'll, be, uh, I'll dive into this shortly. Um, so uh, definitely, if you're using um, Cosmos DB, use the .NET 
uh, SDK v3. And with that, I will jump into some code. So I'll, quick, I'll quickly uh, show you the difference between .NET Core SDK uh, version 2 and 3. So, uh, so for my .NET Core SDK version 2, this is an example of uh, the .NET Core SDK version 2. So uh, generally uh, what you do is you, you instantiate a client that uh, with the endpoint and the URL that you get from the Cosmos uh, once you create a Cosmos instance, you get the uh, once you create a Cosmos account, you get the key and the URLs. You instantiate a document client, and then you create a database. And uh, generally, in the cloud, it's always good to use defensive programming techniques, which means that you don't assume something exists. You always create it and then use it, uh, or you plan for creating it, uh, or plan that it doesn't exist. Uh, so in this instance, it goes through, it reads the list of databases and creates a database. Now this is version two. Version three actually uh, is, uh, in version three, uh, the, cost, uh, the document client has been replaced by a Cosmos client. So that's cool because uh, obviously you want to have a more generic one. And you can use the Cosmos client and the create database if not exist that call um, and similar calls at the database and collection level have been made much more stable and where you don't have to go through and catch the exceptions before you create the database so uh, it's it's a more intuitive uh, uh, developer experience um, so there's definitely improvements on that side so uh, let's See if we can one. Uh, the other thing uh, the, the .NET uh, SDK v3 has introduced is uh, it's using streaming APIs, uh, and the advantage of using streaming APIs is that uh, previous versions always did serializing and deserializing of the data each time you uh, requested data, and that kind of incurs a overhead and the streaming APIs cut down on that um, because they stream over the wire. So uh, if you want to pass, if you want to get data from the container and pass it on to something else, you can use the streaming API and not have the overhead of serializing, deserializing in between. Um, so next thing I want to do is jump into this. Uh, Cosmos DB obviously provides SQL style uh, queries. So we will see if we can find a collection that has data in it. And obviously, um, I have a collection, and this collection has some data in it. So uh, we'll run some queries in here. So let's look at the form. Let me look at a data uh, record and see what I can query. So I'll query for all the records that have day of week Fridays and see what comes up. So going to say we're select where c dot day of week equals Friday probably oh it's case sensitive so you got to watch out for that So obviously this query ran and it consumed, you can see that it's only showing 100 records because when you get your records back, if you don't want to display all of them, you can paginate them and that's always a good practice. And this uh, 100 records, it's consumed about 12 R, uh, resource units. So, uh, you know, as you can see, you can run SQL style queries and uh, it's, it's uh, the one thing I would watch out for is every time you run a query, always keep tabs on the request charge. Um, and you want to get your request, you, you want to constantly monitor your request charge because that may decide how much uh, resource or request units you provision for your collections. Uh,
the, so this is an example of how I would uh, uh, run a query from a cl uh, from a C sharp client. So in this uh, instance, I'm getting a query stream iterator, and I'm passing in the actual query. Uh, uh, I'm passing in the actual query, and, and I'm using the partition key, which uh, in the partition key last name. So I'm providing the family name Anderson, and that will return some data. So uh, this uh, one thing to keep in mind is uh, if you generally when you run your queries, if you wanted to get if you want to get the best efficiency in a, in a large amount of if you have a large amount of data and you want to get the best efficiency, somehow try to include the partition key in the query. Indexing. So this is what uh, uh, this is another co component that uh, impacts uh, query performance. So, in the, so for let's take a look at this instance. So, this uh, in this instance, if I ran a query on locations where the city is Berlin, uh, it'll go through uh, my uh, collection and it'll uh, filter out all the all the data that have fields called location. And uh, uh, that have uh, location fields, and these location fields will have city subfields, and the city will be called Berlin. So it's filtering out all. So if you have uh, multiple schemas, so let's say I have uh, other records in my uh, collection that have headquarters, these don't have locations or city. So in this case, it will completely ignore those records. So this is uh, another way. This not only helps filtering out data and making your queries more efficient, but it also helps with schema agnosticism. Uh, I will say that uh, other things you want to uh, think uh, in here is you want to measure your re uh, request units per query, ensure you have provisioned enough throughput when you run your queries. Uh, you want to you always use partition key, like I was saying earlier. Uh, you want to follow SDK best practices like direct connectivity and all of these listed in the documentation and uh, also uh, try to run your queries within the same uh, uh, account for network overhead when you run them. Uh, Server-side programming, this is important because uh, often when you get data, you want to validate and transform your data um, before, you, before you store it or right after you store it. And in that case, you use something like a trigger um, or there's also stored procedures and user-defined functions that Cosmos DB runs. These run server-side uh, because they are JSON, JavaScript code. Uh, they uh, can basically map to the JSON data and uh, perform optimizations like lazy materialization. Uh, and the other thing about server-side programming is that uh, you can guarantee uh, that the database ops within stored procedures and triggers in particular are atomic. So you get some amount of the A in asset transactions. Um, talk about uh, change feed processor, which is one of the best features of Cosmos DB. Uh, it's a, basically a persistent log of documents. So when uh, Cosmos DB ingests uh, data or updates data, uh, the, it maintains a persistent log, and, uh, and uh, you can uh, connect uh, multiple uh, clients to your log. So, uh, and uh, these clients basically use another Cosmos uh, coll uh, collection called leases. That way, even if they drop their connection, they can come back and resume from a checkpoint. So this makes it really resilient, and it's used in scenarios like event sourcing, uh, and you know, even near real-time migration. So, for instance, if you ever uh, did the wrong partition key, which happens, uh, you know, more often than we would like to admit, um, you can perform a near real-time migration by updating the records in your collection and then reading them through the change feed and copying them to a different collection. So you can actually use your uh, change feed in a whole bunch of cool scenarios. Definitely something that you should read more into. Um, Entity Framework 3, obviously hey, any Santosh, um, I was gonna say we're uh, right at discussion the... of uh, cost. 
Cosmos in a .NET conference would be incomplete without Entity Framework 3, but because I'm running short on time, I'll quickly see if I can package and in your context you would uh, use uh, you would basically uh, override your on configuring method to use the cosmos and in this case it uses the local connection string but obviously if you are deploying this to azure you would replace this with the azure connection string and uh, Yeah, so once you do that, your context can uh, use the Cosmos client and then it can perform the, uh, it can access the database and the container and it can just work like any other Cosmos client. And I see that I'm running close on time, so I'll keep this moment. I was gonna say, we're, we're right on time. And finally, DevOps. No, uh, no discussion of Cosmos is complete without DevOps. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of things. In, hey, Sant uh, Santosh, I was going to say we're right on time. Okay. Um, okay. I'll quickly wrap this up. So, Cosmos DB provides an emulator, and uh, uh, that you can use, and you can actually uh, uh -huh. connect your tests to that emulator, so you can perform integration testing on your DevOps pipeline with Cosmos. And I will wrap up with a couple of thoughts and. Uh, after that, uh, if time permitting, I'll take questions. So my parting thoughts are get start, started right away. Download the emulator. It has sample projects you can get started. Uh, polyglot data, you know, the LinkedIn example I gave. Uh, so if we, that's an interesting thought experiment to get you started. Uh, but you, you know, you can use a whole bunch of different scenarios. Uh, sh shift your focus from uh, like thinking of cost to thinking of what value it adds and uh, TCO, it's the to total cost of ownership or non-ownership. So you don't have to host anything or uh, th that's really important. And then uh, understand partitioning throughput, how it impacts performance. Attend the data modeling talk that's an hour from now. Uh, learn to leverage server-side code like triggers and uh, stored procedures. Uh, use the change feed. I'm sure that you'll find a good use case for that. And finally, use good coding and DevOps practices. And these are some resources. And uh, that's mine for if you ever wanted to, to get, get in, in touch, touch with me, the best uh, way to do it is Twitter. And I'll take any questions. Or if you're over on time, then I'll just uh, wrap up. Yeah, we're over on time. So everybody, if you have questions, you want to bring up your, uh, your Twitter, um... Uh, a slide there, buddy. Santosh, can you bring that up for us? Minimize the Skype and show sure. that quick so people can see that. So anybody, if you can, any questions, go ahead and put them there and we will get started. Thank you so much, Santosh, for taking the time to talk to us. And we will okay. get here going with Steve and talking about the eShop. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.